Now here is a practical technique. The first thing you do, you must know exactly what you want in this world. When you know exactly what you want, make as lifelike a representation as possible of what you would see and what you would touch and what you would do and physically moving in such a state. For example, suppose I wanted a home, but I had no money, but I still know what I want. I, without taking anything into consideration, I would make as lifelike a representation of the home that I would like, with all the things in it that I would want. And then, this night, as I would go to bed, I would, in a state, a drowsy, sleepy state, the state that borders upon sleep, I would imagine that I am actually in such a house, that were I to step off the bed, I would step upon the floor of that house. Were I to leave this room, I would enter the room that is adjacent to my imagined room in that house. And while I am touching the furniture and feeling it to be solidly real, and while I am moving from one room to the other in my imaginary house, I would go sound asleep in that state. And I know that in a way I could not consciously devise, I would realize my house. I have seen it work time and time again. If I wanted promotion in my business, I would ask myself what additional responsibilities would be mine were I to be given this great promotion. What would I do? What would I say? What would I see? How would I act? And then in my imagination, I would begin to see and touch and do and act as I would outwardly see and touch and act were I in that position. If I now desired the mate of my life, were I now in search of some wonderful girl or some wonderful man, what would I actually find myself doing that would imply that I have found my state? For instance, suppose now I was a lady. One thing I would definitely do, I would wear a wedding ring. I would take my imaginary hand and I would feel the ring that I would imagine to be there. And I would keep on feeling it and feeling it until it seemed to me to be solidly real. I would give it all the sensory vividness I am capable of giving anything. And while I am feeling my imaginary ring, which implies I am married, I would sleep. This story is told us in the Song of Songs, or the Song of Solomon. It is said, At night on my bed, I sought him whom my soul loveth. I found him whom my soul loveth. And I would not let him go until I brought him into my mother's house, right into the chamber of her that conceived me. If I would take that beautiful poem and put it into modern English, into practical language, it would be this. While sitting in my chair, I would feel myself right into the situation of my fulfilled desire. And having felt myself into that state, I would not let it go. I would keep that mood alive, and in that mood, I would sleep. That is, taking it right into my mother's chamber, into the chamber of her that conceived me. You know, people are totally unaware of this fantastic power of the imagination. But when man begins to discover this power within him, he never plays the part that he formerly played. He doesn't turn back and become just the reflective life. From here on in, he is the affector of life. The secret of it is to center your imagination in the feeling of the wish fulfilled and remain therein. For in our capacity to live in the feeling of the wish fulfilled lies our capacity to live the more abundant life. Most of us are afraid to imagine ourselves as important and noble individuals, secure in our contribution to the world, just because at the very moment that we start our assumption, reason and our senses deny the truth of our assumption. We seem to be in the grip of an unconscious urge which makes us cling desperately to the world of familiar things and resist all that threatens to tear us away from our familiar and seemingly safe moorings. But I appeal to you to try it. If you try it, you will discover this great wisdom of the ancients, for they told it to us in their own strange, wonderful, symbolical form. 
But unfortunately, you and I misinterpreted their stories and took it for history when they intended it as instruction to simply achieve our every objective. You see, imagination puts us inwardly in touch with a world of states. These states are existent, they are present now, but they are mere possibilities while we think of them. But they become overpoweringly real when we think from them and dwell in them. You know, there's a wide difference between thinking of what you want in this world and thinking from what you want. Let me tell you when I first heard of the strange and wonderful power of the imagination. It was in 1933 in New York City. An old friend of mine taught it to me. He turned to the 14th of John, and this is what he read. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. He explained to me that this central character of the Gospels was human imagination. That mansion was not a place in some heavenly house, but simply my desire. If I would make a living representation of the state desired, and then enter that state and abide in that state, I would realize it. At the time, I wanted to make a trip to the island of Barbados in the West Indies, but I had no money. He explained to me that if I would that night as I slept in New York City, assume that I was sleeping in my earthly father's house in Barbados, and go sound to sleep in that state, that I would realize my trip. Well, I took him at his word and tried it. For one month, night after night, as I fell asleep, I assumed I was sleeping in my father's home in Barbados. At the end of my month, an invitation from my family came, inviting me to spend the winter in Barbados. I sailed for Barbados the early part of December of that year. From then on, I knew I had found this Savior in myself. The old man told me that it would never fail. Even after it happened, I could hardly believe that it would not have happened anyway. That's how strange this whole thing is. On reflection, it happens so naturally. You begin to feel or to tell yourself what it would have happened anyway and you quickly recover from this wonderful experience of yours. It never failed me if I would give the mood, the imagined mood, sense revividness. I could tell you unnumbered case histories to show you how it works, but in essence it's simple. You simply know what you want. When you know what you want, you're thinking of it. That is not enough. You must now begin to think from it. Well, how could I think from it? I am sitting here and I desire to be elsewhere. How could I, while sitting here physically, put myself in imagination at a point in space removed from this room and make that real to me? Quite easily. My imagination puts me in touch inwardly with that state. I imagine that I am actually where I desire to be. Now can I tell that I am there? There is only one way to prove that I am there. For what a man sees when he describes his world is as he describes it relative to himself. So what the world looks like depends entirely upon where I stand when I make my observation. So if, as I describe my world, it is related to that point in space I imagine that I am occupying, then I must be there. I am not there physically, no, but I am there in my imagination, and my imagination is my real self. And where I go in imagination and make it real, there I shall go in the flesh also. When in that state I fall asleep, it is done. I have never seen it fail. So this is the simple technique on how to use your imagination to realize your every 